So um, please welcome the first round of applause from there to here, Don Collins. Thank you. Are we sitting on these? Yeah, I am. Uh, I had to make me even more uncomfortable and weird. Okay. The chairs, they're not the most comfortable of chairs, but... I would just like to say I'm over 30, and I seem to be the only person in this entire building that is. <laughs> you, I presume you just get an email when you're 30, right, just totally... Please. You're right. Oh, thank God. Oh, yeah, dial up. Remember dial up? Amazing. <laughs> That's very much Logan's run. Um, do you want to talk about yourself, the book, where the books come from? I, whatever you want me to talk about, really. Um, with, with why the book and why now? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> why the book, why now? Well, for someone that said, and I really meant it, I didn't think anyone should write an autobiography till you're, I think, at least 60, and definitely, like, you've finished. I've now done two, but in my defence, the first one was in 2004, straight after Trigger Happy, and someone approached me and said, would you like to write an autobiography? And I said, absolutely no way, no way. And then they told me what the advance was going to be, and I went, yeah, okay, I mean, uh, <laughs> possibly. And actually, weirdly, I had this exact same thing with Lily Allen once. I'm going to name drop straight away, but... Uh, name drop away. I was doing this reality show where I was a paparazzi and I'd spent two weeks completely forgetting who I was and just chasing celebs and being hit around the head and stuff. And on the last night, I'd finished and I'd just got Lily Allen. I went back to a bar in Soho and I was relaxing and Lily Allen walks in and I'm like, fuck, I'm still... And I thought, no, I'm not paparazzi mode anymore. And she makes a beeline for me and she sits down, she's chatting away and I'm trying to pretend it's really cool, but this is when she was at her coolest, you know. And I'm just going, yeah, just sitting here with Lily Allen, it's all really cool. And she's moaning away. She's going, oh, you know, I, all this stuff's going on, and now they've asked me to write a book. And I think, maybe this is the time for me to sort of step in as an elder man of show business. So I said, Lily, you know, if you want my advice, you know, you're top in the charts, you're really cool at the moment. Don't stretch yourself too wide by doing a book as well. Why would you? And she goes, well, they've offered me 800 grand. And I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe do the book. But actually, as it turned out, she had to hand the advance back because she didn't manage to do the book. So there you go. So I have written it, and I... Unlike, weirdly, a lot of people, I'm quite surprised, I'm not going to name names, Russell Brand, but uh, how many people that you do assume would be smart enough to write their own book actually don't write it? I mean, I'm sure they have an input in it, some more than others. So, uh, but it's weird, there are a lot of ghostwriters, but I did actually write my book myself. And when in the, what I got from the, your book... Which, was Deep Unhappiness. Uh, no, no. It's, um, <laughs> when you did Trigger Happy TV, yeah. which you're probably best known for still, yeah, you, thanks, a, yeah. a lot of it... <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, no, it's fine. A lot of it was found in the edit. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And I wondered with the book, did you edit... Was it the same process? Did you no. write a lot and edit down? Or? It's really weird. I'm the world's most... Uh, one of the reasons I've had such an odd career in all sorts of ways, ups and downs, is I'm so easily bored and I can't really stick at anything. And actually, the only thing I've ever really put just total focus in was Trigger Happy, weirdly, and it was kind of when we didn't know, I didn't, there was no pressure, I didn't know Trigger Happy was going to be huge, it was the first comedy show I'd done, and it was literally like, I'd suddenly got in a situation where me and my new best friend, Sam, who I made it with, who I'd made, met in a bar, as I was telling my girlfriend that I had the opportunity to make this show, but I couldn't afford a cameraman, and literally Sam was the barman, leant over and goes, I can do that. No one believes the story, but that is how we met. So we did Trigger Happy, really thinking we were still excited we were going to be on telly, and everyone left us alone. We spent a year. We basically had fun. All the things that afterwards came when advertising agencies would bring us up and offer stupid money if we did an ad in the Trigger Happy style. And we'd nod, going, well, it's quite tricky. The Trigger Happy style was just me making Sam laugh, and he'd shake the camera, and that was it. <laughs> but essentially, Trigger Happy is a pretty good... Uh, hidden camera show, but I think where it really differentiated was when we went into the edit, and I'm kind of a frustrated musician. I love music. I was in a band, but sadly have no musical talent, but I've always loved loads and loads of music. So when Trigger Happy, it was never like thought through like this, but when I got into the edit, it just made sense to me to put my favourite moments of my favourite tracks over stuff. And I remember the first time we gave something in, it was the dogs, fighting dogs. We used to have two dogs that used to beat each other up. Like a lot of other things in Trigger Happy, that started with a vague point. We used to walk through, round here actually, because we were based on Charing Cross Road, and it was when all the CCTV cameras just started going up. And you used to see all these things and think, who watches these cameras? Like, who's just monitoring it? So it just made us laugh to have the idea of setting up two dogs, one tied to a chair, and there's an execution scene. And we just love the idea that somewhere in some bank, someone's spooling through, and somebody goes, Son, what the fuck was that? <laughs> So they used to start on a camera and swoop down, but after a bit we just thought, it doesn't matter, just do that. And the first time we gave it in, I had some 
weird U2 opera tune on it. It was all quite weird, because you think, this is quite moving, but actually it's just a dog. And someone at Channel 4 said, don't you think you should put some cartoon music on it? And I was just like, oh my god, you so don't get this. So, to answer the question in a long way, yes, we spent a long time in the edit, and I think it was, a lot of it was about the music. Uh, music was incredibly expensive to clear abroad. The only place that bought the entire soundtrack was Germany, weirdly, and I didn't sell it to America for ages because if it went to America, I had to go with a terrible sounder like, so all these great songs I'd chosen, someone in his basement just did a sort of literally like a homemade version of it, and it was just like, oh, I can't. But in the end, I, I gave up, and it did get to the States like that. So yeah, the edit was what it was all about, really. And I think people don't appreciate that, really, because I think in a funny sense, if you took all the music off, you've got a reasonably funny hidden camera show where the punchline is either me running away or telling someone I've had a shattering nervous breakdown. But I think the music gave it um, unwarranted depth, maybe. You, you gave, there were three soundtracks. Three CDs. There were three CDs, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was the coolest thing. I got a gold record for the soundtracks, and I've never felt more of a fraud. Because <laughs> part of me is like, that's the dream. When I grew up, I didn't dream of being a comedian. I sort of, I suppose, dreamt of being a rock star. And suddenly I've got my own gold record, but what's it for? It's for playing, it's a bit like being a DJ. I'm sorry, I don't see the skill in being a DJ. You're playing someone else's records. I mean, that's it. So maybe you can choose good ones. But then to be given a gold disc, go, oh, that was me, actually, it was great. The best music story about it was probably the most requested song. Because a lot of people commented on the songs, and we even had a couple of bands. There was one called the Honey Smugglers, who were the most obscure band. I don't know how I heard their one song. But after I put it on Trigger Happy, they got back together, which is quite exciting. It only lasted three months and then broke up again. But the most requested tune was Gordon Lightfoot, If You Could Read My Mind. And that was on this mad portrait uh, artist in, in Trafalgar Square. And I hadn't heard of Gordon Lightfoot. But now I'm married to a Canadian, I know that he's probably the most famous Canadian apart from Celine Dion, and that song has been recorded, covered by so many people. But at the time, I didn't know, and we kept getting these requests for, what is this song? And someone said, you know what, again, it was me trying to be a pop star, why don't we get hold of Gordon Lightfoot? He's probably living in some, you know, log cabin in the middle of nowhere, and we'd tell him it's a big hit in England, and we could make a video like Vic Reeves did with Dizzy, and we'd get the Christmas number one, so I was so excited. So, we contacted his people, sent the request. Nothing came back, nothing came back. Finally, I rang up and they said, well, can we see the show? So we sent them the show, time ticked, nothing came out. So finally, I'm like, fuck's sake. So I had a vision of someone running up a long path to Gordon saying, Gordon, Gordon, you're gonna be back. So finally, I ring up and go, look, is this gonna happen or not? And they go, friends said no. And I said, well, why? And he said, Gordon saw the show and well, he just thought it was shit. <laughs> so there you go, Gordon Whitefoot, wanker. <laughs> With the, the later series, did, and you, you seem to thrive under having less control from sort of the powers that be and so forth. Well, I, th I think all telly, yeah. all telly, and probably all business in a funny way, must thrive from... Well, it's, it's an odd thing. I think when you have a certain level of... I don't know how to explain it, really. I, I think the moment you have... The odd thing to me is when Trigger Happy was unknown and it wasn't a hit at all, we were totally left on our own. And I think certainly in comedy, the one thing... When people say, as they often do on Twitter, you're not funny, I'm like, well, that's a very subjective thing to say because if I find it funny, then it is funny. It's just you don't find it funny. But the one thing that definitely isn't funny is if 10 people get together and decide what's funny. You end up with the equivalent of the Eurostar interior decoration where someone just thought, you know what, yellow and grey is not going to... It's going to offend the least amount of people. So to me, in comedy, even if you're doing something that's literally everyone's saying is awful. If you find it funny, that's all you can do. The moment you try and guess what other people find funny or listen to a committee, you're fucked. And the irony of telly is that Trigger Happy, no one knew who we were, so we totally were left alone, even to, into the edit and everything. And then the moment it was a hit, logic should tell you, well, you know, it ain't broke, you know, it ain't broke, fix it. But of course, everyone then jumps in because they want to sort of be part of it, and it instantly goes to pot, really. Um, and... When that, because it was sandwiched between, when it launched, sandwiched between Friends and Frasier on Channel 4. It was insane. Was huge. I mean, I was still at the stage, I'd never been on telly apart from, I'd done some stuff on the Paramount Comedy Channel, uh, which was this weird channel that only played sort of imported American shows. But when I was there, it was just a really odd time. For two years, there were all these people doing little shows that we put out between the programs. They were called interstitials. And in telly, normally, you never get the opportunity to practice. 
you, you know, you literally, you're either a stand-up or someone else and you become well-known and then your first thing you do is on telly and that's a very tricky thing. Whereas if you're a, a stand-up, you spend years honing your craft and stuff. But for some reason, we all got lucky, we were paid nothing. But at that time at Paramount Comedy Channel, which was just up the road in Rathbone Place, Sasha Baron Cohen was doing some early Borat, as it turned out then. Lee Francis was in the art department. Uh, Little Britain were wandering around doing a weird show called Mash and Peas. Simon Pegg was doing an odd show with Edgar Wright. I mean, it was crazy. And I was looking at all these people thinking, it was almost like a bit of a Saturday Night Live sort of thing, except they've all gone on to do incredibly well in comedy apart from me, and I've written this book. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was good. I can't remember the question, but... Um, how did you cope with that level of fame? Like, that very badly. Fame? Uh, very badly in all sorts of ways. And I, I think I only didn't understand why, because it's, it's not like I wanted to be famous, because I'm not interested in fame, but I definitely wanted to be successful, because it allows you to do these things you're enjoying. And weirdly, I just read an interview of Louis Theroux, who kind of disappeared as well. He, he was getting big at the same time as Trigger Happy with Weird Weekends, and he went off to L.A., and I never quite understood why. And he said he went from making these documentaries that he really enjoyed, and also an important part was that people didn't really know who Louis Theroux was. The moment you kind of felt, is he going to stitch you up, it would have been more difficult. And he said it suddenly went from making shows he was really interested in that people liked to suddenly being constantly told, oh... Is he going to be able to do it again? Like, are you going to get the ratings? And I suppose that's just showbiz, really. But it's deeply unpleasant, because then you start, A, getting worried. So you start making bad decisions, I think. And then in the end, you either go completely against it and say, fuck you, and everyone hates you. Or you completely toe the line and make appalling stuff. And I think I've done both, actually. So <laughs> I've done the full gamut, you know. And when you were making uh, Trigger Happy TV, mm. the book said you, never, you got arrested a fair bit. Or throughout, I, throughout, you've been... Ar I've been, been arrested... Been, you've not been beaten up? No, weirdly. I mean, think, I'm the first person to get beaten up. I have this really odd ability to sort of get people to the stage where they want to beat you up. Although, in my defence, my comedy is not Beatle. It's really easy to get people angry. Like, you just find out what they love, their car, their garden, and then just turn up and announce the council's turned your garden into a public loo, step back, you know, they all get mental. <laughs> I didn't want to make people angry. My whole thing, I just love... Almost, it was annoying that people had to sign afterwards and you let them know, which we did. Because I kind of love the idea of just inserting this surreal moment into someone's day. So in my mind, I always loved someone coming home and the wife saying, how was your day today? And he'd go, yeah, it was good, it was good. It was a bit weird. I was in the park and a <laughs> scout approached me and asked me to mark him out of ten for his homoerotic dancing badge. But, and I loved that. It's just kind of, it was the idea that this weird world is going on. And if I had to admit the person I probably nicked most ideas from. I don't know if anyone knows the cartoons by Gary Larson called The Far Side, which you're all too young, probably, but it was amazing. Yeah, yeah thank you. you know. and, and he was all about things like, you know, a bunch of sheep in a field chatting away and smoking, and one of them shouts, car, and they all go back down, sort of thing. And so I, I love that kind of odd, slightly surreal humour. But then again, I think when you're a success, you even start believing yourself that you meant more than that because analysing comedy is terrible. All I wanted to do was be funny. And there was a scene where, I, a terrible one actually, it wasn't even funny, where I'm a Chelsea pensioner pushing a, a, pushing a pram down, a, down the step sort of thing. I'm mean, really not funny looking back. And if anything, it was a sort of mild piss take of that scene in the, what's the movie? Uh, Untouchables. Untouchables, thank you very much. But The Guardian reviewed it saying, incredibly brave reworking of Eisenstein's Potemkin. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, which was a famous scene on the steps in the Russian Revolution. So I was like, of course, that's exactly <laughs> what I meant. Sort of thing. So yeah. And what, from filming, Trigger Happy, the, the three seasons were there? Uh, there were two seasons of six shows each. And then I wanted to, again, this is my first huge career mistake. The one thing I've learned is never ever, table, thank you, never make any decision that's important straight after you've just finished doing something. And I'm sure that applies in anything else because you're sick, sick to death of it, you're knackered, you're disillusioned, you probably hate everyone you're with. So the moment you finish that, that is not the moment to say, oh, I'm not going to do another Trigger Happy, which is what I told Channel 4. What you need to do is say, uh, I'd like to do some vanity projects for a couple of years and I'll give you a Trigger Happy every two years when I'm refreshed. As it was, I treated it a bit like a, a band, really. I was like, right, we've made our great album, now let's, let's leave, I'm never going to do it again. And then Channel 4 said, well, will you at least do two Christmas specials? And I said, no. Nah. And then they offered me a stupid amount of money. I went, yeah, yeah, OK, I will. And they were actually quite good. And then, but then we kind of fell out. I fell out with Channel 4. It was quite odd. And just as I was wondering what to do, 
I got a call from the Pope, or Alan Yentob, as we call him, who is this weird head of the BBC, who literally pillages the, the modern art um, galleries for, to put in his... I mean, he's like a sort of warlord at the top of the BBC. And he took me to the River Cafe, and I wasn't quite sure what I was doing there, and he took a call halfway through, sorry, Mick Jagger. And I was like, what, who is this guy? And I slowly realized he was luring me to the BBC. And A, I thought, well, that's good, because I can go somewhere else and start again. And he kept saying, the thing about the BBC is, you know, we're public. We're paid for by the, uh, by the people, by the license fee. There's no ads. So we're not interested in ratings. There'll be no pressure. We just want you to make whatever it is you want to make. And I thought, that sounds brilliant. The moment I got the BBC, I realized that was total bollocks. I mean, they're so obsessed with ratings that I got terrified. But on top of that, when you work for the BBC, things change. On my second day at the Beeb, I got given an office. And I'm sitting there thinking, I've got an office. This is so exciting. And a guy comes in looking almost like one of the two Ronnies, like a BBC workman. And he goes, Mr. Jolly, uh, everyone who gets a new office gets it decorated. So I just want to know what colour you'd like it painted. I'm like, I have not thought about it. He goes, well, we're going to paint it. So what colour would you like? And I went, red. So he goes, all right. And off he went. <laughs> two days later in the mirror, huge page saying, trigger happy star has tantrum, refuses to start, no, sees red refuses to start work at the BBC until his suite of offices are painted red. And I'm like, <laughs> fucking hell. So I suddenly realized that we weren't little punky people on the outside. And suddenly you're sort of, you were on your pedestal and the only way was down. And that's terrifying, especially when I'm just much happier being a sort of little irritant really on the side. I'm much happier doing that, which luckily is what I've come back to being. So. What's the most outlandish thing a tabloid has lied about? Uh, well, my favourite one was I found out I'm sort of quite estranged from a lot of my family, which I won't bore you with, but I've got quite an odd family. And my sister I hadn't spoken to for about eight years. She lives in Lebanon, and my dad and I sort of barely spoke, and he lived in France. And suddenly I get two calls from them, which was rare enough. And my sister said, just to let you know, this was just a trigger happy was happening, someone from the Daily Mail, and this is in Beirut in the middle of the war. I'm like, fuck it, how did he get there? You know, it was knocking on the door trying to ask questions about you because they were doing a piece on my background. She goes, I hope just, I'm not sure if I helped you or not, but I set the dogs on them. And I was like, fucking brilliant, that's great. <laughs> and then my dad, who a man who literally I'd had probably four conversations with in 10 years, all about cricket, rings me up out of the blue, very awkward conversation. And he says, and obviously he was feeling a bit guilty about our relationship. He said, a man, very nice man from the Daily Mail turned up at the door uh, asking about you. So I hope you don't mind. I let him in and I was like, what? And, and then I gave him a couple of photos as well. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, you do. So anyway, when the expose came out, I was like, what are they going to do? And it literally said, exclusive, Trigger Happy Star is middle class. And I was like, oh, OK, if that's the best you can do. But then they had two pictures my dad had given of one of me on a pony and one of me naked. But my, I mean, it was about when I was about four years old. It was like, oh. So now I've been all right with tabloids. I've kind of kept away from them, really. Yeah. And do you think that you seeking out new challenges and being an irritant, as you say, do you think that led you to be, that you've done a fair number of the I'm a Celeb and Splash and so forth? Is that the reason you chose those, or just the challenge? Well, I think there's two things. One thing the book kind of talks about is my, my life makes total sense to me, but because I've, I think most people when they're, for instance, like a hidden camera comedian, in England, hidden camera is seen really as a bit rubbish, and most of it is rubbish. It's just people shouting, and it's a bit crap. In America, because hidden camera, a lot of people don't realize, it is all improvised. Like, there's no script. So when I go up to someone, I'm making it up as I go, and that's quite a skill. But in England, there's nowhere to go with that, really, apart from that awful show, uh, was it Whose Line Is It Anyway, or which always ended up with John Sessions pretending he was in a lift. In America, people who do this sort of thing move on to do things like Curb Your Enthusiasm, Spinal Tap, which is all sort of improv and comedy, and it's kind of quite respected. So here, if you do... If you look at Phone Jacker or you look at Ali G, what you really do is like you make your name doing that and then you become an actor or you, you know, that's, and I have no interest in becoming an actor. My only skill is making up my own stuff. I don't want to learn, spout someone else's stuff. So for me, when Trigger Happy happened, I thought, great, this allows me to write for newspapers, go travel writing and write travel books, which I've done. I've written books and gone skiing in Iran and weekended in Chernobyl and gone to North Korea. But the problem is that the sort of people like Trigger Happy, is not, I don't want to say this exactly, but not great readers, maybe, let's say. So they're, and the people who love travel books are possibly not the greatest fans of hidden cameras. So I've got these two odd fan bases that if they met in a room would hate each other, probably. And one side might actually beat the other side up. So it's quite odd to do. So wh when I did comedy, it would pay the bills. And then I'd go and do what I wanted, which is travel writing, which, let me tell you, does not pay anything. I mean, you basically fund your own travel 
but the good thing is someone will read about it afterwards. That's the only good thing. And then when comedy stopped for a bit, the reality shows were literally another way of just paying the mortgage so I could go traveling. I'm a celeb. I kind of was in so two minds. They ask everyone every year. So as I can see, I'm a celeb has a list of 3,000 celebs. And every year, they send out this mass email that goes, we'd love you to be on I'm a Celeb. And then depending on the state of your career, certain people say yes. And then once they got the pool of people who said yes, they cast it. So they'd asked me for about eight years, and I'd said no, despite loving the show. And then just as they asked me that year, I suddenly thought, A, hmm, I need a bit of money. B, I genuinely thought, actually, it might suit me, because it's one of the few places one of the people who was in there with me was Jenny Eclair, who I really loved. I don't know many comedians. But Jenny, weirdly, was quite frightened in there because she's used to doing stand-up. She's got a routine. She controls her comedy. So she was always worried when we were set a task because she's not good at improv. Whereas for me, it was a joy. They told me to be a spy and lie to the camp and pretend to speak Korean. I'm like, hello, this is exactly <laughs> what it should be. So yeah, that's why I did those shows. The only one I do regret is Splash, if I have to talk about it. The reason I did Splash... <laughs> A, Splash hadn't gone out. So the way it was sold to you, the way these shows are sold to you is always very different from how they are. It was, with Tom Daly. it was sold to me as, would you like to learn an Olympic skill, high diving in particular? And I weirdly have a bit of a back history in diving. I go to Canada every year with my kids. We jump off these cliffs. And I'm pretty good at jumping off. But there are always these annoying 15-year-olds who turn up and do a flip. And in the back of my mind, I thought, just before I get too old, I'd love to just have one dive that kind of shows them up a bit. So they go, Tom Daly's going to teach you. I'm like, well, that's brilliant. What, what could go wrong? It was, A, it was a rip-off. Tom Daly turned up probably twice for about 10 minutes, filmed going, hmm, that's good, and then disappeared. Secondly, what I didn't realise was the show was designed as a sort of homoerotic Towie spin-off. So, and the first guess was when we had a costume thing. I go, what do you mean costume? We're just, I'm not wearing Speedos, but we're going to be wearing swing trunks. They go, oh, no. And it was all tassels and stuff. And I was like, oh, my God. Then Joey Essex turned up, and I met him, and I just couldn't understand if he was real or not. <laughs> First two times I met him, genuinely, he was locked in the loo and couldn't get out, and I had to release him. And I thought, <laughs> genuinely, and I thought he's either the greatest improv comedian that exists, or he's so stupid, it's like, how did he get here, sort of thing. <laughs> And then come the night, I was actually doing quite well. Like in, in rehearsal, I was the first person to go off the 10-metre board, which is seriously frightening. And I thought, you know what, I'll be all right. My kids come along. It's probably the first thing my kids have come to. My wife, it's all there. It's live. And I get so nervous beforehand that me and Donna Rare consume a whole bottle of champagne. I'm totally pissed. Adrenaline hits me so badly. I go up, and they announce your name. And I'm like in a dream. I go to the top thing, and I just say, get over with the dive. And Vernon Kay's up there going, so Dom, how are you feeling? I'm like, I don't fucking, I don't. And everything I'd learned went, and I just jumped, and I literally went slow motion. I felt myself go over, and I thought, fuck, this is it. I'm going to land on my back. I'm either going to die or be paralyzed, live on air, in a homoerotic reality show, in front of my children. And I hit the, hit the water, it hurt, like nothing I can describe. And I came up, and I was sort of like that. There wasn't even a murmur from the crowd. It wasn't even sympathy. It was just like, fucking hell. And I was just like that. And all I could see was my daughter, who's just, oh, shit. Like that. So that was probably the lowest moment of my career. Yeah. But the joy of doing what I do, because I write, is even then I was thinking, actually, this will be funny to write about. And I suppose that's the one good thing. If I travel right, obviously I'd love to go somewhere, and it's brilliant. I stay in an amazing hotel, and everyone's lovely, and I have a nice holiday. But if, like everyone, you go on a trip and it turns into a nightmare, I'm always thinking, well, actually, this is going to be a lot funnier to write about. So I kind of always, part of me is thinking, if things go wrong, there's probably, I can use it, yeah. Um, from the travel writing, what's the, your biggest blag, do you reckon? And we'll take some questions. Holy fuck, I mean, my whole life, all travel writing is blag. It's insane, because travel writing pays zero money, because they basically say, look, you know, we'll probably be able to organise a free hotel, sometimes a free flight. So what, you want to be paid as well? And you're like, well, kind of, yeah. So there's two types of travel writing. There's what I call the Piers Morgan travel writing, Mail on Sunday, where Piers Morgan takes his wife and two kids to Lamborghini World in Dubai, which is just the sort of place he'd go. Hello, Piers. And uh, all's paid. He insists on first class there. He wanders around Lamborghini World, stays in the hotel for two nights, comes back, writes literally an article saying, my kids and I went to Lamborghini World. We drove Lamborghinis. It was amazing. And that's it. And then there's proper travel writing, which to me is about going somewhere off the beaten track, trying to really get an adventure, which is more and more hard in 
because nowadays it's very difficult anywhere where you're not 100 meters from a Starbucks, even if you're in Libya or wherever. So things like North Korea, but in fact, the only place you can really go, unfortunately, are places that are either in the middle of a civil war or under a horrible dictatorship. So you have this odd, should I go there or not? And that's proper travel writing. And in the old days, people like Sunday Times would pay for that. But now, more and more, it's all about advertising, weirdly, because Google, I think, says the algorithms, they don't, they're all trying to drive you to their website, and they don't want this sort of thing. So now travel writing in Sunday Times is lists of world's top 10 beaches and best honeymoon things. And that's probably Google's fault, actually, or BuzzFeed. Uh, On that, does anyone have any questions? Well, I can hear you probably, but... Yeah, you probably can. <laughs> Okay, like, um, I just wondered your thoughts on a show like uh, Revolution will be televised. Obviously, you know, uh, hidden camera um, got some more of a political agenda. I don't know if you sort of knew the lads, uh, found the show. It's kind of a similar point to where you left off. It's like a couple of shows here, you know, they're well recognized. They've gone to the States as kind of an extension strategy, I guess. Do you think it's the end for them? Oh, you see, I should never slag off comedy, but I'm going to. I hate that show, and I'll tell you why I hate it. I started off, the first job I got was on the Mark Thomas comedy product which was basically an English version of the Michael Moore show before Michael Moore. And Mark is a stand-up who you might know is a bit of a political activist and can get a bit annoying occasionally with his like, you know, militant setting. But the idea at the time was good. It was like, let's take on MPs and set them up and do kind of stunts. And I think that was the first one. And I was the researcher on that show and that's where I started off. And then when I was doing early stuff for Trigger Happy, I took that on and I was attacking Cool Britannia and putting fake Millennium Domes in Peter Mandelson's garden and standing as a teddy bear and stuff. And it was kind of odd, surreal activism. And when we went to Channel 4 to pitch for the show, I was actually pitching a show which was about taking on Cool Britannia. And it was kind of a bit like that show. And the commissioning editor had just finished doing Chris Morris's Brass Eye, which literally she'd been in nothing but legal battles for a year. And she just went, oh, fuck, not another one. She said, please, if you could do anything that wasn't sort of socially based. So she said, can you do something silly? And that's how Trigger Happy happened. With the revolution that must be televised, my problem with it, genuinely, is that I just don't think it's that funny. And I think you either have to do something where you're being funny, and if you make a point, it's kind of as a side thing, or you have to literally be, I'm a hardcore whatever. And I think they're not that political, but they're not that funny. And so they end up kind of just you know, shoving microphones in their face. But on the other hand, maybe I'm just old and I don't know comedy anymore. I don't know. I love the name of the show. And I kind of think, yeah, you're exactly what I was, an annoying little posh bloke uh, 20 years ago. So probably that's why I don't like it, because they're on telly and I'm not. And they won a BAFTA. So did Phone Jacker. I didn't win a BAFTA. So yeah, that's why. But good luck to them. And, and the other thing you do, sorry, when they go to America, what I've realized again is the classic way all shows go. You do two shows, your second show is probably a bit more successful. And then the third show, it's called the On the Buses Spanish Holiday thing. You suddenly think, fuck, we can get people to come. So I started seeing if I could get madness. To, you get cameos. And then once you've got all the cameos of the people you want, so Ricky Gervais did it well with extras, you then think, where can we go on holiday? We should go to do an American show. And they very rarely work when you go abroad. So I didn't like to say anything there, but there you go. No, no, it's good to hear yeah. I'm really sorry if you are watching this. I hate slagging off other comedians. I'm not slagging them off, it's just whatever. Have you seen much of YouTube videos? Because Prank videos are quite big on YouTube, and I wonder if you've seen them or what Trigger Happy would be like. Well, two things weird. The Trigger Happy happened, literally, the reason Trigger Happy happened was because it was just at that year where cameras became available in the shops. I think they were called three chip cameras, which now, when you look at the quality, is awful. But it was the first time that for a grand, you could buy a camera which you could use, which was at the time considered good enough to go on telly. A year before that, if you wanted to film anything, you had to hire a proper cameraman, proper sound man. Nothing wrong with that, but they cost money. So it meant you only had a limited amount of time. And suddenly we bought that camera and we just filmed and filmed because it wasn't costing any money. So that was huge. But if YouTube had existed then, and it came probably five years afterwards, I wouldn't have bothered going to TV channels. Why would I go to a TV channel and say, you know, can I give you 90% of my earnings to put it out? I would have set up a YouTube channel, and if it worked well enough, worked out some sort of deal. I don't know how you pay them, but there you go. So, yeah, I think YouTube's great for that. And weirdly, pranks are one of the things that really... Pranks and cats seem to be the things that really <laughs> work. And ironically, there is no hub. that You know, if you want humour, you go to College Humour or Unilad, or I'm sure there's many cat websites. But ironically, there is no go-to site for hidden camera stuff. 
which gives me an idea, which is what I'm doing now. Hey, Don, thanks for coming on. Um, could you just give us a bit of a insight into the process of creative process that gave rise to so many of those really exquisite scenes? Well, I always say this. I always say this is a joke, but genuinely, it's kind of probably I predated having walked around your offices. The concept of the hot desk and the sleep pod and stuff. When we first started, because we didn't know how to come up with ideas, we kind of we'd heard about this thing called the writing room, and we were trying to be grown ups. We thought, "Fuck, we're on Channel Four, so we'd sit in a room together and literally stare at each other, me and Sam, and have no ideas at all. And then we realised the best way to have ideas, especially for Trigger Happy, because it was about stuff was just to go and do things. So I think we blagged, I think, you know, Sam and I went Euro, we went interrailing, which is crazy. We got Channel 4 to pay for us to go on a two-week railway journey around Europe. And I think I got two ideas from that. We went up to, <laughs> we went up to Scotland to play golf, didn't get any ideas from that. But we got arrested, because on the way down, we couldn't resist. It, it was, it's a horrible joke, and it's not, I'm not proud of it, but we went through this tiny little town, and there was this sign outside this building and it said West Highlands Dyslexic Association. And it was so weird, and it was like the only thing in this village. And so I'm not proud of this, it's not funny, but we did instantly get a little sign, put it on a board, and wrote, stop this now, but all misspelt, and just stood outside it. And it just made us laugh, but of course they thought we were having a go at dyslexics, which we weren't. But, but to answer your question, genuinely, I normally answer this really glibly and just say, in the pub. But genuinely, that is what happens. I think the only real difference with something like Trig Happy is saying everyone goes out with mates and you, you get a bit pissed and you all have funny ideas, but most of us, possibly not at Google, then wake up the next morning and think, oh, that was a good night, go, go to work. And I was suddenly in the stage where you'd wake up and think, fuck, oh, that was a good idea. You'd wait till you were sober to check it was good and then you'd ring someone up. And so, for instance, the great example, my favourite sketch ever is the snail, just because it's kind of perfect, really. And it was this snail crossing, coming up to a zebra crossing, walking totally normally, waiting by the zebra crossing, obviously with some very sad David Bowie music, just to make it arty. And then everyone stops, and then I get on the floor, and I crawl really slowly <laughs> across the floor, and then I get up and walk across normally. Now, there's so many elements to that. I remember thinking suddenly, because you get into the mood, you think, you see a milkman, you think, oh, milkman. And I suddenly was in the pub, and I remember it was a cock and bottle in Notting Hill, and I go to Sam, I go, snail! Snail, and, and the great thing was, we both realized we're probably in the only country in the world where that would work. If I went to a, to a road in America and started crawling across as a snail, I'd be run over by a monster truck, a redneck would get out and sort of beat me to death. But there is one bit when you rewatch that, if you ever do rewatch it, I'm going across really slowly and there's a cab there and there's another one, and as I'm crawling across, Sam's hidden in a garden, I suddenly realize there's a gap, obviously, between the two cars, and if there was a motorbike coming, it wouldn't see the snail. And so halfway across, I suddenly think, fuck, if I'm in the middle and a motorbike comes, I'm going to be hit. So I sort of speed up a bit and then slow down. So in hindsight, I've looked at that sketch and I've thought, if I was really perfectionist, it should have had a tiny bit of slime coming out the back of it. But apart from that, it was perfect. And that was a, class and that was a classic example of how we overplayed it. We did it the first time. It worked perfectly. And literally, the first time we ever did it was on Redcliffe Gardens. And that was the one we used in Trigger Happy. So we should have just said, right, let's move on. But we were so excited and laughing. Sam goes, do it again, do it again. I go, oh, yeah, all right, do it again. So the same thing happens. I go up, crawl across, and suddenly I'm halfway across. I've just got past the motorbike gap. And I'm, all I can see is feet. And I see that one of the cars has stopped. There's two feet have got out, like two pairs of feet. And they're walking towards me. And I was thinking, fuck, are they going to kick me in the face? I couldn't move or get out or anything like that. And I sort of look up, and they're two policemen. <laughs> So there's this fantastic moment which kind of reminded me of the Paul Merton sketch where he's a policeman on acid. And it, it, I can imagine him going, we observed the gastropod crawl <laughs> slowly across the zebra crossing. But anyway, there's this little standoff and I finally go, all right, <laughs> like that. <laughs> and there's another great silence and then the policeman, he's quite a sweary one, just said, I have no fucking idea what you are fucking doing, but if you don't fuck off now, you'll be fucking arrested. <laughs> so I stand up and I sprint off going, sorry, like that. And we couldn't show it because we didn't have the policeman's uh, consent. But that's probably my favourite off clip, off out clip sort of thing. But basically, the pub. Yeah. Hey, Don. Thanks for coming in. Um, so you talked about the process of creating creative process. Yeah. Um, as a cricket fan, I had the pleasure of listening to your interview on TMS uh, the other day. Test match special. None of you know that. That's so, the yeah, highlight of my entire life. I've just had Desert Island Disc said no for the third time. This time, quite specifically. 
I'm afraid he's not of our caliber. And you're like, yeah, fair enough, I'm not ready. But test match special I was on. <laughs> Does anyone know what that is? 40 minutes with aggers, it's like the lunchtime in the middle of a test match. If you're a, middle, if you're a middle class Englishman, you've made it, basically. Like, my dad <laughs> died before, that would be the first thing I've ever done, that my dad would go, oh, that's good, yeah. <laughs> so I enjoyed that. Uh, so my question is, um, if, if you are offered to trade your whole career as this has happened, or maybe as the cooks, or you said you were a bit of a bowler, so Andrew Flintoff. I'm more a batsman, you, I think, but yeah, yeah. Would you take it? So basically, the career I've had, or international... Or as the cook. It depends, isn't it? Because he might completely fuck up. Because I think the only way I'd take the swap is I'd A, need to be a, a successful cricketer, so, and Cook has his moments, doesn't he? But also you then, however good you are as a cricketer, your life's over at 35, unless you make the jump into commentary, which, you know, both of them does whatever. And I think Cook is too boring to do that. I don't think he would do that. So I'd have to be someone that made the jump and... KP. Oh, is he KP? Is he... Sorry, this is a cricket thing, which I'll quickly think. <laughs> KP is this Kevin Peterson who's, apart from being South African, which is a big problem playing for England, is probably our greatest player, but he's been such a wanker that essentially the rest of the team don't want him in. And I think it doesn't matter. If he's good, he should be in. But the problem is Piers Morgan has literally launched a one-man internet campaign demanding that he should go back in. And I'm so annoyed by Piers Morgan that I don't want KP in the team. So I think he's probably doing it. But yeah, I wouldn't mind being KP. Quite good. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'd like to do both. Is that possible? I'd like to open yeah, the batting right. and then go and do the squirrel stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the England team mascot. That's what I could be. I don't think it's going to happen anyway. It's too late. Hey, John. Thanks very much. It's been really fun. Um, Thank you. Quick question from Trigger Happy Days. Was there anything that was cut by Channel 4 that you thought was brilliant um, that you could talk us through? See, that's really funny. They didn't actually have power of edit. I had power of uh, final cut, but you couldn't be a complete wanker. Like, you, you basically, we spent all the time in the edit, you got the show, and then the commissioners would come in. And even if it was the most perfect program ever, which it never was, they, they wouldn't have a job if they didn't sort of say something. So our plan, our cunning plan, <laughs> which we thought was really cool, was we'd always put in, we'd make the show beautiful and great, and then we'd always put in something really shit that we hated. And like, it just stuck out. And the idea was they'll come in and they'll say, well, I love it, but yeah. apart from that. And we'd sort of go, oh, really, you don't like it? And then look like we're really accessible. <laughs> we'd go, okay, we'll take it out. And I swear, we did it three times. And two of the three times, that was the bit they liked best. <laughs> and, it, and, and they literally got angry when we took it out. So we kind of gave that up. So they never cut anything out. But there were a couple of things we did, which Fergie, <laughs> two weirdest celebs I ever did, Fergie, Princess Fergie, whatever her fucking name is. We were at, I was at some weird drinks party somewhere and I was trying to get people as this celeb interviewer. And I didn't know Fergie was going to be there. And I suddenly see Fergie walking towards me. And Sam's there with this tiny camera and I'm holding a microphone. So I'm like, fuck it, we're going to do it. So I go up to her and her bodyguards are sort of, I go, excuse me, can we have a chat? She goes, yeah, 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 totally. So I go, great, I have no idea what I'm going to do. And I go, you're, you're live right now on Good Morning Mexico, I think it's so something like that. <laughs> and she literally didn't bat an eyelid. She goes, oh. And so I go, tell us about all your great work in America. And she starts talking. And about 10 seconds in, I suddenly go, sorry, Your Highness, we've just gone for an ad break. So if we can just hold our positions and we're back in two minutes. And she went for it. And I said, can no one move at all? We need to be in exactly the same position when we come back. So for two minutes, in the middle of this drinks party, Fergie is just standing like this. <laughs> and I'm like, this is fucking the best thing I've ever done. And then I go, and we are live again. Sorry, you were saying. And then she starts talking again. I go, sorry, they've lost interest. They're gone. And then she goes, what? And we went outside. And I just said to Sam, get in a cab now. We've fucking got to put this out. And if the internet had been around, you know, I'd have just uploaded that immediately. But I swear, I don't know how they found out, but by the time we got back to Charing Cross Road, from, it was in Sloane Square, it was about 40 minutes, there was a phone call from Mishcon Rea, those terrifying solicitors, uh, with literally like, you show that and you'll be executed or whatever. <laughs> and Channel 4 was so terrified that they didn't show that, which, which was annoying. And the other one, which is more odd, was Kate Adie, who I quite like. A lot of the people I used to get were really just an excuse to meet them. And I went to the press club where Kate Adie was giving some talk on being a foreign correspondent. And this is the woman that's been in Tiananmen Square and fought all this sort of stuff. And so I think, what am I going to do, really? Because I really like her. I don't want to take the piss. And so she comes out, and I think, right, I know what I'm going to do. 
So I start talking to her, I go, okay, AD, you, you're a huge foreign correspondent, you've been to all these great places, how is it dealing with these places? And she starts talking, and suddenly Sam shouts, incoming! And I hit the deck. Yeah? And I think that's really funny, it's a kind of nod towards her foreign correspondent stuff. She just looks, literally, it's like you've farted in front of your mother. She's just like, what is going on? And I stand up, and then I'm so embarrassed, I do what I always did, I just run away. <laughs> leaving Sam to do what he always did, to pretend he's a freelancer who doesn't know what's going on. And I have so many recordings of Sam on the phone to no one going, I don't know, I was just booked to do this and I'm here with Kate Aidy and the guy ran away. But, but what was surprising was Kate Aidy demanded to have the tape. And so we got this great thing. She said, give me that tape, it must be erased. And Sam went, no. And Kate Aidy goes, give me the tape. And so I had this recording of Kate Aidy trying to fucking censor everything she was up against. And again, I said to Channel 4, this is an amazing point about how media kind of... They went, no, can't show it, it's got me. So those are the two I liked. Very long lunch break you get here. Do you not do any work? <laughs> Can we hear the squirrel story? Oh, the squirrel? Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, that was... I kind of... Technically, it was a sort of loose area as to who owned all those props because I had them made. So the squirrels I had made... I used to use... There was a shop in Esca, called Escapade in Camden Town and we used to think it was a bit more punky to... Just Actually, it's a lot of how we got some ideas. We'd go to Escapade, which was this terrible fancy dress shop. Uh, is that time up? Is this like your emergency call? I've got to go somewhere. Fire alarm in the building has been activated. It wasn't me. Fire alarm being investigated. Please remain at your workplace. Yeah. And further <laughs> so, someone is freaking out in the sleep pod right now. Yeah. Like, Fuck! I can't get out! <laughs> we'll, we'll just carry on. Okay. I'll just quickly finish this one. So, so, we used to go to Escapade and literally flick through their terrible book of costumes. <laughs> is this you guys doing me? It is, isn't it? <laughs> I've finally been done. It, it, it's killing the vibe, I think. The story is in the book. I could sell it. I, I, basically, I got flooded. A loss adjuster came to my house to check all the stuff that got flooded. And she was American because so many people got flooded. They'd flown people in who'd done Hurricane Katrina. And I had all this stuff in the courtyard. And she starts noting it and she goes, OK, we've got some boots, clothes, three giant squirrels, one six... What is that, sir? I go, it's a six-foot turd. And she goes, one six-foot turd. And they paid up for the whole lot, but I don't have the squirrels anymore. <laughs> Sure. Where am I doing that? Here.